it's great to be here. Uh, I, I've taught at West Point a few times, but this is my first time at JSAL, first time in Florida. Uh, we saw, I saw Florida Man at Gator World recently, which was a great experience, and seeing the trucks, it's, it's, it's eye-opening. Um, what I want to do is really talk about the, the British way in intelligence, which sounds immensely arrogant, but there we go. Uh, and um, <clears throat> it really goes back to a book, in some ways from the 90 years ago now, uh, Basil Littleheart, army captain, um, who back in the 30s and 40s wrote lots and lots of books about British military, British warfare. And he said back in 1932, if you look at how Britain has fought wars going back for hundreds of years, um, he would argue it was based on two different uh, elements, mobility and surprise and maritime strategy. Now, while those are not right now, and we don't need to go into that, the point of the lecture really is if you survey the history of British intelligence and you look at the characteristics and what makes it the way it is, are there elements to it that make it unique? Uh, and one of the fascinating things for me, I think, is how different British and American intelligence is. Uh, and I won't talk about the sort of special relationship, but happy to get into that in, in questions afterwards. But there are a number of very important differences, and I, I hope to tease some of those out as, as we go through. So this is what I'd like to cover. Uh, the intelligence cycle in a British context, the different bits of the system, and the characteristics. A and the first thought I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with now, and I'll come back to it at the end, is this question about how do you construct an intelligence community? For Britain, and I'll explain this, the system has evolved over years, and it's evolved as the threats change, the system adapts to meet those threats. That's very different, I think, to if you said, here we are in 2022, blank piece of paper, we have a, th a threat to the East, uh, Russia, Ukraine, we have terrorism hasn't entirely gone away, other threats facing the UK. How do we construct an intelligence community to meet those threats? That, I think, comes up with a different answer to the, the system we have. Uh, and one of, the, uh, one of the elements of this, I think, is that the British system has often been very, very reactive rather than preemptive. It, it's been very slow at times to think, where might threats come from? How do we adapt ourselves and create a system that could meet whatever the future might hold? As opposed to saying, this is the threat in front of us. How do we uh, adapt and move from there? But we'll come back to that. So what is British intelligence? Well, um, unlike the US, we have no definition of intelligence in a British way. We have no definition of what the intelligence community is and which bits of the system are in the community. Uh, this is probably the only example we have, and it's now getting on for 20 years old. Uh, and it, what, it's what came out of the war in Iraq, the, 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 the faulty intelligence that led to the decision to invade and get involved in Iraq. Uh, and Lord Butler, there he is, he was a former cabinet secretary, which is the, the chief um, person in the civil service, the, the most senior person. Uh, he wrote this report with a number of others, it's online if you're interested. And in the very first chapter of it, he came up with the nature and use of intelligence. And in that, he tried to describe how intelligence operated in a British system, uh, looking at these different organisations, and I'll, I'll go through these in, in, in sort of in a few slides time and go through them. But what he did is he took the sort of classic intelligence cycle, which people often learn, and you can pick apart, and it's it's too simplistic and all the rest of it. But he said actually, if you look at it in the British way, the analysis stage needs to be split into three: validation, analysis, and assessment, and those go on in different bits of the system and they look a bit different and, and we'll go through those. So if we're trying to think about how a country does intelligence, we can, we can think about that in different ways. What are the national approaches? What are the cultural characteristics of intelligence? And one way is to look at how it does it in practice and we can look at this system and we can think about how it works in practice. We can look at the general characteristics and I would say there are two general characteristics to British intelligence. How are you doing? Um, the first is the committee approach. In the UK, in any walk of life, if there is a problem to be faced, the response is to form a committee and to discuss what the problem is. Is that, I don't know if that's an American thing as well or not. We just try to solve it. You just solve it, yeah. okay. We, 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 we have a committee and we have a secretary and then you have to debate what it means. Um, the other one, and the second one I think is, is most definitely different to the US, 
is the idea that consensus is the beating heart of British intelligence. And I'll explain what I mean by these. So we can look at the approaches, we can look at the characteristics, we can look at, this is a very exciting slide, I hope you're ready. We ha in UK universities, we have to issue trigger warnings if you're about to show, you know, so we're in a war studies department, if you're showing a body, a, a, a slide of dead bodies, you have to issue a trigger warning so students don't faint. Um, here is a, 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 a thrilling slide, which almost certainly should have a trigger warning. So another way we can think about how to organize an intelligence community is to look at how it works. And if you think this is not exciting enough, this shows lines of ministerial accountability, which is about as jazzy as you can get on a Thursday lunchtime, I think, in, uh, in an auditorium. And I'll go through these a little bit as we go through it. So you can look at all of these and you can look at different ways of looking at a country's intelligence community and then say, well, actually, what does this tell us? How do we get further than looking at the organizations or the characteristics or other things? Uh, and in the UK, there are a number of characteristics. Uh, one is, we can say from the outset, there is a cyclical process. And I'll talk about that in terms of the requirements and priorities system. The system is based, in theory at least, on producing all source assessments. While there is a mechanism for single source intelligence to go directly to customers, the whole system theoretically, and mostly practically, is based on the idea of all source assessments. Uh, and increasingly, there is a two-way feedback mechanism. So producers of intelligence are encouraged to speak to customers of intelligence very, very regularly to ensure it's meeting requirements, it's on the right topics, it's delivered in the right way, et cetera, et cetera. But before we can unpick any of these, um, we need to go back and look at where the intelligence system came from. Uh, and the system in the UK goes back 500 years, if you go back to, the, to its earliest points. Uh, it goes back to the man on the left with the frilly thing around his neck, Sir Francis Walsingham. Um, Queen Elizabeth I's spy master, and uh, there is rumoured to be a portrait of him that hangs in the office of the chief of MI6. Uh, and Walsingham was Elizabeth I spy master, created the first sort of network of informers, had a system for gathering their intelligence, bringing it together, protecting the, fr the throne from the nasty Spanish and also from the the nasty Catholics. Um, and his system existed for a little while uh, uh, and vanished. But it was only in October of 1909 that the modern system was created. Uh, and the modern system of British intelligence came about largely because there was a, a, an author of fictional books, uh, a Brit who had a very French sounding name called William Le Cue. And in the early 1900s, he started writing lots of books about how in quaint little English villages, there were these nasty Germans with big moustaches hiding behind bushes, and they were jumping out, and they were stealing our secrets, and they were coming over and, you know, stealing our, our, our kids and stuff. A and it created this mass paranoia, this mass hysteria, which in 1909 led the government to create an intelligence system. And the intelligence system then, in a sense, was not new. The army, the war office, uh, and the Admiralty, the Navy, had their own intelligence branches and they did not talk to one another, they did not interact with one another. And in 1909, the idea was that you had to have some sort of civilian system for gathering intelligence on Germans, gathering intelligence on the German threat overseas and on German agents operating uh, in the UK. And the overseas branch was headed by this naval officer in uh, the middle, Mansfield Cumming. Impressively for a naval officer, he suffered from seasickness and spent most of his naval career on land, which, uh, you know, didn't stop him going very far. Um, and he's one of these great figures, if, if, if you're interested in history and you sort of read uh, historical books, at various points there are these characters that jump off the page and they're larger than life. Uh, and he was chief of MI6, the foreign branch, uh, the secret intelligence service to give it its official name. Um, from 1909 until the early 1920s. In the First World War, his son was uh, on, the, on the Western Front in France fighting and as uh, an early advocate of the motor vehicle. He had a Rolls Royce, as of course every officer did in those days. Um, he was driving around the front visiting his son and, uh, and they went round a bend and his son was thrown out of this open top Rolls Royce and flung against a tree, knocked unconscious. Uh, and Cumming was trapped by his lower leg under the car, which had flipped over. Uh, and seeing his son bleeding unconscious, he got his pocket knife out and 
cut off the lower half of his leg so he could crawl away. Uh, his son died and he was back at work within a month or so. But the lesson from that he took was how do you tell if someone is good enough for the new organisation SIS, MI6? Uh, he had a wooden prosthetic fitted and he would sit behind a massive oak desk in the offices of MI6 uh, with his pocket knife there, his letter opener. And when someone came in midway through the interview to try and see if they were good enough to join, he would get this letter opener out and stab himself in the leg. And the person's reaction was what dictated whether or not they were good enough to join Britain's intelligence service, which I think health and safety has now done away with, sadly. But um, I think would be a would be a good lesson for us all. Um, but he was in charge of the, the overseas branch. Uh, his counterpart was an army officer, uh, Vernon Kell, who was in charge of the domestic branch. And had you asked anyone in 1909, how do you define intelligence? They would have said, intelligence is a military thing. It's looking at military capabilities, looking at uh, bits of equipment, looking at uh, bores of cannons and all the rest of it. Uh, it's looking at the number of people uh, a, a, a military has. It's not about intentions. It's not looking, for instance, about what the Germans might do or how they might change things. And actually, intelligence would take a very long time to evolve. Uh, it was really only in the sort of weeks and months prior to World War II that intelligence would begin to take on some sense of interest in intentions and what that meant. And, and it would really not be until the 50s that it would take on things like uh, economic matters, uh, scientific matters, and, and other things. But the historical roots are important because that division in the UK between foreign and domestic, home and overseas, still is in, in existence today. Uh, there were some problems in the 60s to do with the Commonwealth. Was the Commonwealth home or overseas? I, I won't bore you with the details. Um, how that works today is much more complex because, of course, people moving much more between home and overseas. And, and, and terrorism uh, and international terrorism really has challenged a lot of that because you would have, for instance, a, a Britain of Pakistani descent who would be in London one day, uh, in Pakistan the next day, flying back to the London the week after. And, and the question of whose responsibility it was to, to monitor that person meant that the whole system had to get much more joined up and, and joined up teams were, were created. But the point of this anyway is to show that the, history, the, the history of the organisations are very, very important in the way that they've evolved and the way that we see them today. So how does the system work in uh, practice? Well, of course, before anything can be done, there has to be a, a requirement for it. Uh, and up until 2010, from the sort of 19, from World War II really up until 2010, the responsibility for this lay with the Joint Intelligence Committee. And I'll, I'll come back and speak a bit more about that a bit later on. Uh, in 2010, when David Cameron was Prime Minister, the National Security Council, quite different to your National Security Council, was created. There you can see what it was designed to do. Uh, and the National Security Council, which has actually just changed name to something else, um, chaired by the Prime Minister, uh, includes the senior politicians in government, it includes the chief of the defence staff, that should be singular, not plural, chief of the defence staff, um, as well as the heads of MI6, SIS, MI5, GCHQ and the JIC chairman. So you have in that forum nowadays this mechanism meeting uh, monthly, if not more regularly, if, if situation demands it, a system where you get the politicians, the uh, head of the armed forces, the heads of the intelligence agencies, coming together and trying to agree on what are the requirements the country faces. And then those are finessed in much more detail in, in other sort of subordinate committees. What does that mean in practice? Well, remember back in the 30s, uh, intelligence priorities were all about military capabilities. The first defined set of priorities we really have in the UK go back to 2006 and uh, if you can remember back to 2006, and I mean, this is the problem teaching at a university. You get older every year, and undergraduates, the first year undergraduate is always 18. And then you think, what do you mean you don't know who Terence Trent Darby is? And I, anyway, that's another story. But you, um, you, you have this problem because now they're, they're too young to remember, you know, 9 11 or the war on terror or anything else. Back to 2006, the priorities were these things that you would think of as fairly obvious, fairly standard, not imaginative, the sorts of threats and priorities a, a, a government should have. Uh, in 2010, when the National Security Council was created, uh, again, you can see ones which are uh, 
fairly standard. I mean, I, I, I think the UK takes no priority for having predicted COVID because this was, of course, nothing to do with COVID. Um, uh, these were the four big priorities. And then 2015, they changed to these. Now, what's interesting about these, I think, and this is where there's, a, there's, there's been a very sort of subtle shift over the last 10 years or so in the UK, is that on the one hand, the traditional threats, the state-based threats, the rise of terrorism, the rise of cyber, uh, things to do with organised crime as well, uh, are, are common and they're understandable and you could guess that those would be government priorities. But I think increasingly things like looking at a major accident or, or hazard or the bottom three um, ones on this slide are really interesting and the question which then arises is why why should the intelligence community have a responsibility or have an ability to predict economic shifts or look at how energy might change in the future or the res or, or what climate change might do uh, and partly that is I think to try and look much further ahead which actually doesn't happen very well in practice what it really reflects more accurately is, is a shift in the UK which was very, very subtle and I think most people didn't notice it. From thinking about intelligence and the Cold War idea that this is about the protection of the country, this is all about existential threats, you know, the Soviet nuclear threat, the German World War II threat, the threats which face the country as a whole. And the way in which terrorism changed that, which was not threatening the country but threatening individuals, and the idea that uh, risk, resilience, security, the ability to bounce back from some kind of uh, attack was just as much a responsibility of the intelligence community as it was looking at the very big threats from other actors, from, from military threats and all the rest of it. Uh, and that continues to change. There, there was a survey done in the UK about five or so years ago saying, what do you see as the biggest threat to you in, in, in you know, coming from, over, from anywhere? Uh, and can you guess the answer? The answer was someone hacking my Amazon account was seen as a much bigger threat than terrorism or you know anything else. And, and it really reflects, I think, the mindset of individuals where it's about you know the threat to me personally, it's not the threat to the country, um, as well as the way that the system has had to change to, to predict those and also bounce back from those. So the priorities continue to change. And, uh, and about 18 months ago, uh, the UK government produced what's called the Integrated Review of Defence and Security, trying to look at where the threats are, but more specifically, how do you come up with, a, I suppose, a whole of government approach involving you know, military, defence, uh, international development, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and that's rapidly having to be revised, because that document 18 months ago was all about the, the sort of Indo-Pacific tilt, as it were, and, it, uh, and now, because of the war in Ukraine, people are beginning to think about how that changes things. So anyway, we can come back to that. So these are the sort of general sense of priorities of where they're going. You know, nothing that necessarily comes as a great surprise. Uh, as I said before, the way that works then is you ha there is an annual process uh, around a committee based on consensus. Everyone has to agree to what these priorities are, uh, agreeing with what they are, and then they are looked at in more detail, devolved to the different organisations to do something about it. Those priorities are particularly relevant to SIS and GCHQ, much less so to MI5. Why is that? Well, once a requirement is placed, uh, the three main agencies responsible for collecting intelligence, of course, have to go out and do that. Uh, and the most well-known of these is, of course, SIS, Secret Intelligence Service, better known as MI6, James Bond's organisation, flies out of this building on a boat. It's a very obvious building. <laughs> Uh, on the Thames, um, it has a very nice bar at the top of it. Uh, and SIS, I mean, unlike the CIA, for instance, when the CIA was founded in 1947, it was not a secret, it was, it was created. Uh, when SIS was created in 1909, it was a secret. In fact, it was not publicly avowed, it was not given a, a legal statutory basis uh, until 1994. It didn't stop Bus conductors would go past its old building on the south side of the Thames, ring the bus and say, you know, everyone for MI6, get off. Um, but people don't talk about it. And even if you have worked for it, still work for it, worked for it 30 years ago, the nature of our Official Secrets Act and the nature of the organisation is you never, ever tell anyone you worked for that organisation. You were a Foreign Office uh, diplomat. Uh, and SIS releases no archival papers whatsoever. So it's very hard to go back and properly look at what it did in the past, uh, 
because there are no real records to work from. There's, there's an official history, but it only goes up to 49. Um, what does SIS do? Well, its website tells us what it does, and of course we can just watch James Bond films and see what it does, which is great. Um, the, the bullet point at the top there gives you a sense. Fundamentally what it does is it runs human agents overseas, collecting humans, uh, operating out of embassies, uh, recruiting uh, agents, of course, in, in, in foreign countries and, and running them against their, their host governments. Um, because it is operating overseas, it's ministerially responsible to the foreign secretary. So in other words, if it wants to undertake a politically dodgy or risky operation, it has to get approval of the foreign secretary, the equivalent of the secretary of state over here, to go ahead and uh, approve that operation. Working with it very closely is um, GCHQ. Uh, this building, which unsurprisingly is nicknamed the Donut, which is about two hours west of London, uh, is the technical arm of British intelligence. Uh, you can see some more bits on here. That, that's a couple of years old, but it's the same sort of thing. Uh, and GCHQ is, is the most expensive of the organisations because of the technical basis. It's the largest in terms of the number of people it employs. It really has two main functions. One of them is the covert collection of technical information, intercepting emails, telephone calls, all the rest of it. Um, it is also responsible through the National Cyber Security Centre for protecting uh, bits of the British system, uh, being responsible for something called cr protection of critical national infrastructure, thrilling things like that. In other words, it has both an offensive and a defensive element to it. Uh, and because it operates overseas, it is also responsible to the Foreign Secretary. Because they both operate overseas, SIS and GCHQ, uh, they are beholden to the annual setting of requirements. That's very different to MI5, which is based on the north side of London. Uh, MI5, its proper name is the Security Service, um, is the domestic branch. It, it works domestically, recruiting human agents, uh, intercepting telephone communications and other things, um, really focused around whatever are deemed to be the threats facing the UK. Generally speaking, those tend to be the obvious things, Russian or Soviet, Soviet now Russian, uh, counter espionage, state based espionage, um, uh, terrorism, a little bit of organised crime, not very much, uh, and other things. Because it operates in the UK, it is responsible to the Home Secretary. So if, for instance, MI5 want to listen to my telephone call, they have to produce quite a large document called a warrant which goes to the Home Secretary or, or someone they delegate it to to sign it off. And it has to be based on quite a sophisticated argument about why that person is up to no good and why they think they need to look at their uh, phone conversation. So these three are the three main intelligence agencies. Uh, they are funded from one central pot of money, which is uh, a roughly in the, f in the region of two and a half billion pounds. Now compare that to a US budget, the CIA, I don't know what it is, but I think the CIA budget a few years ago was something like $80 billion. So the, the magnitude between the British system and the American system is, is, is totally uh, incomparable with one another. The fourth main agency um, is Defence Intelligence, created in the mid-60s. Uh, used to be called the Defence Intelligence Staff. The military decided that if you had the word staff in it, you were therefore subservient, and so they dropped the word staff to make it sound much more impressive, so it's now just Defence Intelligence. Um, now based out of the main Ministry of Defence main building, just off Whitehall, there is the building. Uh, and it has two main functions. One is, as it says there, the overall coordination of intelligence activities throughout the armed forces. The other one, and I'll come back to it in a moment, is that it is the largest, com uh, largest uh, number of analysts within the British system, working on subjects beyond just defence. Defence intelligence is a bit different because it's funded out of the defence budget and it's technically part of the Ministry of Defence, so it has to rely on what the Ministry of Defence is working on for its prioritisation. So at the collection stage, we can argue that everything is coordinated partly through the Joint Intelligence Community, which takes those annual priorities and then looks at them in more detail. Uh, in a slightly simplistic way, Input into the system is by source. If it's collected from a foreign agent, it will come via SIS. If it's collected by a domestic wiretap, for instance, it will come by MI5. What does that mean? Well, Butler, as I said at the start, 
differentiated between these three stages. Uh, the validation stage takes place in one of the collection agencies. They would call themselves collection agencies, but they have a sort of operational analytical function where they will validate the information and say this is from a reliable source or, or, or all the rest. Um, then, then the information is analyzed, and it's often analyzed within a number of places which are functional organizations. So it might be if it's terrorism related, it will be analyzed within the Joint Terrorism Analysis Center. Um, it might be if it's to do with organized crime, it's, it's analyzed within the National Crime Agency and all the rest of it. Uh, then they go into all source assessments, uh, which tend to take place either within the joint intelligence community or defense intelligence uh, when they go into that system. Uh, and just to give you a sense of scale, I'll, I'll talk about the, the joint intelligence committee on the next slide, but just to give you a sense of scale, uh, the, the collection bit, the bits across the bottom, not including the assessment stuff, the four main agencies probably comprise somewhere in the region of 10 to 15,000 people. The people in the Joint Intelligence th Committee that do the big strategic assessments that go up to the Prime Minister and others is about 100 people. So the whole system of British intelligence, I would argue, is predicated on collection. Uh, it's very different to the Australian system, for instance, which has a large office of national uh, intelligence, I think it's just changed name, where they bring all of the analysts into one big organisation uh, in the British system, the analysis takes place in different places depending on what the subject matter is. And generally speaking, that seems to work. But there have been some calls in the past which have always been refuted about, should there be one single organisation that just does all of the analysis? Uh, and most of the analysis, most of the assessment, certainly the all-source assessment, takes place within the Joint Intelligence Committee uh, by the assessment staff, which is about 100 people. Uh, and the Joint Intelligence Committee, which I could wibble on probably all day and bore you to tears about, um, has been around since the mid-1930s, created three years before World War II by uh, a, a sort of military requirement, argument being that if we were going to go to war, which of course we did, uh, you needed to have joined up intelligence for military planning, that if you were going to have the best possible intelligence for fighting the war with Germany, intelligence had to be joined up. Uh, and the Joint Intelligence Committee, that, that's the front door of the building it's in, uh, in the Cabinet Office, um, was created to do that. It's had a number of other roles over time. Some of these still exist, some of them don't exist. But the one that has been consistently there since the 1930s is providing high-level assessments for senior policymakers. So its product, which is released number one on the distribution list, was the Queen, now now the King, and the Queen was the longest, I think, in the world, history ever, recipient of intelligence reports. She, she received them for 70 years, basically. Uh, number two on the list is the Prime Minister, and then it goes down. So these reports go to very, very, the senior most people in government whose job it is to come up with policy, uh, as well as uh, officials in the system. And I'll come back to the, the jick in a minute when I talk about consensus. Um, the other bit that's just worth mentioning quickly uh, is to do with oversight and accountability. Uh, and we only created a, a formal oversight mechanism in 1994 when some of the agencies were created through acts of law. Uh, oversight takes place in, in, in a couple of places, the two boxes, top left and top right. The main one is through a parliamentary, or a a parliamentary committee called the Intelligence and Security Committee, produces annual reports. They're, they're fairly unexciting, but they give you a sense of, of, of things going on. Which, unlike the American equivalent, only looks at things after the event. There is no uh, looking at operations or anything before they take place with, in, in oversight terms. The ISC will only look at things once they've happened, and generally if they go wrong. Sometimes they'll look at big things like a computer system, which... Um, the government spent millions and millions on, which never really worked, and they've looked at why it didn't work and all the rest. Um, the other two bits are, are top left. Um, for instance, MI5, if they want to monitor my phone, as I said, they have to get a warrant. The Interception of Communications Commissioner will every year look at all of the warrants that have been signed off to say, were, was there sufficient cause for signing off those warrants to ensure there's that sense of oversight. Uh, and then there's an Intelligence Services Commissioner, which is... Um, really there that if someone has a grievance, they can go to that person rather than going to the press or, 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 or taking it publicly. 
So oversight exists, but again, it's quite different to the US system. So I said at the start that in my mind, there are two overarching characteristics of British intelligence. One is the committee approach. And we see this, the National Security Council, which actually has now changed just in the last few weeks to the Foreign Policy and Security Council for weird reasons. Um, it takes place there, it takes place in the Joint Intelligence Committee. A and both of those mechanisms are based on consensus. What does the consensus thing mean in practice? That's a very good book, and it's a better cover than yours. Exceptional, it's exceptional, yeah. And it has pictures, does yours have pictures? There's no pictures. Um, what does the Joint Intelligence Committee do? We've spoken about it a little bit in terms of uh, its thing. The key po there are two key points about the Joint Intelligence Committee. Number one, it's based on consensus. Uh, and I'll come back to that on the next slide. Number two is that this is a committee which does not include politicians. And it does not include politicians for the very clear reason that if you want to provide objective intelligence free from political pressures, you don't have politicians in the table, around the table. Um, the very first time a politician ever came to this was in 1979 uh, when Margaret Thatcher became prime minister. At and she was invited to one of these things because she was a very keen advocate of intelligence, probably the keenest prime minister since Churchill had been in charge. Uh, and they invite the, the, the committee decided to invite her to one of the meetings, uh, and they were then deciding, you know, should she sit on the left or the right of the chairman? What looks better? Uh, and in one paper they said, should we look at scientific issues, which we know she's interested in, or the sort of usual boring stuff, which she probably won't be interested in? Uh, and they went for the usual boring stuff. But she came to it anyway, and she, she was very impressed. And, and you can see, actually, in, in the archives, lots of uh, JIC assessments where she sort of scribbled all over them and underlined things. And, and, and in a sense, that's the sort of ultimate test of how good a product is if, if the prime minister or the president or whoever is, in, is engaging with it. But this is the composition. So the composition of this is uh, a chairman who historically comes from the Foreign Office, currently comes from the Foreign Office, but hasn't always. Um, the heads, or in more practical terms, representative, senior representatives of the three main agencies, uh, a senior representative of defence intelligence, usually not the chief who is a three-star officer, but usually one of, one of their deputies, um, and then policy planners from all of the government departments, so defence, foreign office, home office, various others. So you have here a, a, a committee which, is, which comprises the intelligence community, uh, the military sort of in terms of defence intelligence and policy making departments but no politicians even though the number one on the distribution list goes to the Prime Minister. And from its outset in 1936 when it was created it was based on this idea that consensus is the key to producing high level strategic and tactical but mostly strategic intelligence. Um, and that was really a symptom of the British system of government. It, 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 in the First World War, when the cabinet system of government was created in, in the UK, it was based around the idea of collective decision making, that any decision that was reached should include the agreement of everyone who sits around that table. So for the Joint Intelligence Committee, the logic is that the representatives from all of these organisations have to agree to what a paper says before it then goes to the Prime Minister or anyone else. What that means in practice, sorry for flicking through sides, what it means in practice is when you get to these assessment staff, these are the individuals seconded in who write the papers. Uh, they then, when they have a draft, it goes around all of the experts. So if you have a paper on Afghanistan, for argument's sake, um, it would go to the, the experts in, in defence, foreign affairs, uh, international development, everything who knows about Afghanistan. Once all of the experts have agreed with what that paper says, it then goes to the Joint Intelligence Committee, where these individuals will look at them, and once they agree with what it says, it then goes out to the Prime Minister and others for readership. Now, that's very different to the US system. Uh, and and in, in World War II, and again in the, sort of, uh, the mid-50s, when Sherman Kent, who um, is often remembered as the father of strategic intelligence in the CIA, when Sherman Kent looked at this, he said, it's a great system, but it's totally flawed because if you're relying, if you want to reach consensus, there is always the risk that you come down to the lowest common denominator to get an agreement. Uh, and of course, that is an absolute risk of the system. Uh, I, I think the UK would argue that it's part and parcel of how we do things, and so that's how it, it's how it's always been. 
um, one of the um, one of the one of the changes that came out of the Butler report after the Iraq War was uh, that you should be able to include a dissenting opinion in a report, and that came out of the fact that the the WMD analysts in defence intelligence disagreed with the SIS reporting, but had no proper mechanism to express their dissent. Um, but the difference in the British system, in the American system, the best known example I think is from the 50s, the bomber gap, when, when, when the US looked at the, the relationship between the size of the US Air Force and the Soviet Air Force, uh, and the whole system said, we think they're about the same apart from the US Air Force, which said, no, 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 the, the, the Russians have 10 times the size, which then you know Congress approved billions of dollars to increase the Air Force. Um, that would never have been allowed to go through in the UK system as it was, and it would not be allowed to go through in the UK system now because you can only include dissent if everyone represented around the table agrees that the dissenting opinion is valid. So it's a slightly weird definition of dissent, which is, again, very different to the US system. Uh, and I won't dwell on this, but it comes back to a sort of broader argument about the relationship between the intelligence community and the policy community in terms of setting objectives in terms of how close the two communities should work. Uh, Sherman Kent's model, which was all about being the intelligence community pushing policymakers. Uh, Wilmore Kendall, who criticised it, saying, you know, the two communities should be much more closely mixed. Uh, and the British system is very much based on the pool model. Um, in other words, we're small, we don't have very much money, we still think we're great. Uh, and how do you do that effectively? you have to make sure that every intelligence resource is directed towards something which is of use to government. And so increasingly, there's much more interaction between producers and consumers because what's the point of producing intelligence if there's no obvious policy customer or military customer or someone else at the end of it? So let me, um, let me conclude just with a few final slides and uh, thoughts. So as I said earlier, MI5 stands out from the other agencies because while SIS and GCHQ and, and to some extent defence intelligence take their requirements from this annual process, MI5 in theory at least meets whatever the threats are that face um, the country. Within the intelligence system, if you think back to that, to the, the sort of organogram, um, the input into it is by source, foreign humans, domestic technical things. Um, output then is by topic to the organisation which is responsible for that thematic subject. Um, within the intelligence community, uh, the Joint Intelligence Committee at one level looks down upon this multi-billion pound organisation, helping refine priorities, uh, helping look over how the community does things, historically at least lobbying for more money, for more uh, permission to undertake sort of risky operations. But also looks up to the policymakers, pushing these reports upwards to policymakers to say this is the combined considered assessment of the intelligence community which your policies should be underpinned by. Uh, and the JIC is, JIC is running very, very highly at the moment because of the war in Ukraine, which it, 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 it sort of foresaw to some extent, which it's been very accurately reporting on. But as the two elements that are, I think are really the beating heart of this, one is the committee approach, that you have committees which, where you have representatives from all of the different organisations, and they're based on consensus, that if any decision needs to be taken, everyone has to agree. Uh, and the last bullet, which is not on there, I would say, is this idea that the system has evolved over time. You know, why do we still have this difference between domestic and, and foreign? They recruit different types of people in terms of the staff that work for them. But there is also this differentiation between the threat at home and the threat overseas, even if they're often the same uh, adversary. So I'm going to finish with two quotes. Um, the first one uh, comes from the Foreign Office research analyst who said, we're brilliant, we always get things right. Year after year, the warriors and fretters would come to me with awful predictions of the outbreak of war. I denied it each time I was only wrong twice, 1914 and 1919. Uh, and the last slide, which is really one for Dave, um, because we support the same football soccer team in, in London. Um, and uh, I've tried this joke a few times, and it almost always falls flat, and I suspect it will also fall flat now. But this was when one of the greatest West Ham players, a very fiery Italian, had a bit of a soft spot for Mussolini, but we'll ignore that. Uh, and um, he, was, uh, he, he, he threatened to leave us. He wanted to go to another team. 
And uh, the man who fed his piranhas knew he wanted to leave. And he said, if you're leaving, I'm going to kill your fish. And it shows the importance of knowing your enemy. Well, you slightly got it. Anyway, thanks very much. Anyway, I shall stop there. Uh, look forward to any questions or anything else you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you.